So, this is a patient of 32 years old male, female. And uh, patient was having the pain in the in the right hand. So neck pain, which is radiating down till the right thumb. Pain is associated with some tingling sensations. Little bit of numbness on the lateral aspect of the forearm and the thumb. Patient is unable to sleep on that side. Patient is having pain is increasing when the hang, hand is hanging. If the hand is unrest on the table or anything, then the pain is little less. Patient has taken the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug without any relief. So, what is your provisional diagnosis? Provisional diagnosis is prolapsed disc with C6 radiculopathy. What are the investigations to be done in this patient? One is MRI of cervical spine and is EMG NCB studies can also be advised. Apart from that, other routine blood investigations will also be done with the coagulation profile and the blood sugar. Because if you need to do the interventions in the future, you need all those investigations. So, why are you thinking that this is your prolapse defective disc? What are the points in favor? Yes, because of the radiating hand pain in a dermatomal distribution, the commonest reason is your the radicular pain because of the prolapsed intervertebral disc. That is the commonest reason. And here because the pain is going on the lateral aspect of the forearm and the thumb, so here it goes in, in distribution of the C6. So C6 radicular pain is most likely. So what are the other clinical tests that can be positive here? So spiraling test might be positive, the Jackson compression test might be positive, relief sign putting the hand will be positive. Here also there is some clues that if the patient's hand is hanging, then the pain is increasing and if the patient hand on the rest, then the patient's pain is decreasing. So one of the very important tests to differentiate between the shoulder pathology and the cervical spine pathology is just to put, put your hand here because many a times C5 radicular pain is a dilemma because C5, C4, they are supplying the solar area. So now if the patient is having the C5 or C4 radicular pain, the, it's difficult to make a diagnosis whether the pain is intrinsic or extrinsic. If it is an intrinsic pain, shoulder pathology, most of the times this abduction causes the increase of the pain. Whereas if it is radicular pain, this is going to relieve the pain. So same way here the relief sign might be positive. So, spiraling test might be positive, rejection compression might be positive, relief sign might be positive. Apart from that, all the neurological examinations should also be done to see how much is the neural deficit. Here the patient is complaining of a little bit of numbness. So, how much is the numbness? How is the reflex? What is the motor power? So, this also should be assessed. So for the C6, which muscle can be weak? Biceps. So biceps patient should be, you know, biceps power should be assisted. And which jerk might be reduced? Biceps jerk might be reduced. So sometimes 
supernatural judge also. Supernatural is C5 mostly, but C5, C6. C5, C6 and uh, biceps also C5, C6. So this should be, these two jars should be also checked. Then what else should be done? EMG and C might be showing you that this is coming positive. So next what should you should do? How to treat this patient? Patient has given a history of six weeks. So how you are going to treat this patient? First is conservative management. The conservative management What are the drugs in the conservative management? One is patient is having intractable pain, so you should be giving some analgesics like paracetamol or simple NSAIDs or COX-2 inhibitors. Along with that, the most important part here is to give anticonvulsant. Which anticonvulsant? Best is pregabalin because it will be having the quicker onset of action. Gopentin is slower onset of action. Because patient is having severe pain, we should be giving recovery. Then, what else? Antidepressant should be given or not? Antidepressant don't have much role here. The reason is, this is a shorter duration pain, only one and a half month. Antidepressant is normally given when the pain is more than three months. But it is not a very strict rule, so if you are giving some antidepressant also, so that is not unacceptable. But mostly the drug will be one analgesics and pregabalin. If the pain is, you have tried these things and patient was already trying analgesics over the counter analgesics, no relief. Then what should be done? Interventions. Hot interventions. Cervical epidural. Which hot kind of epidural? How many types of cervical epidurals are there? Interlaminar midline, interlaminar paramedian, and transforaminal. But here, cervical area transforaminal epidural should be avoided. Why? because of the presence of the vertebral artery. So cervical, epidural, steroid, injection must not be done. What should be done is interlaminar epidural, either midline or paramedian. Nowadays, paramedian interlaminar epidural is mostly preferred. So how to prepare the patient? Similar on the day and before. Before. You should be doing all the investigations to confirm your diagnosis. You should be doing the investigations to rule out the other differential diagnosis. Here I forgot to mention, what are the differential diagnoses? Yes, my facial pain. Facet pain do not come up to the... That is also very unlikely. Interrupt of the peripheral nerves. Then, diabetic neuropathy, particularly mono neuropathy, which can involve the root. Okay, so these all these uh, uh, differential diagnoses should be ruled out with your investigations. Another differential diagnosis is your post herpetic neuralgia also. That can also cause a radicular distribution pain. So now coming to the interlaminar epidural, preparation of the patient, so investigations and on the day of the procedure preparation is again Kneel per mouth for 4 hours, secure intravenous line and vital parameter monitoring. These three you should not forget. 
vital parameter monitoring, secure interference line and nil per month for 4 hours. Antibiotic majority do not prefer, so antibiotic no need of telling antibiotic. Then what else, how, how the patient will be lying? Patient will be lying prone with a pillow under the chest to flex the neck. Why flexing of the neck is important? Because flexion of the neck increases the epidural space. How it increases the epidural space? So cervical epidural space, posterior epidural space in the lower cervical area is minimal. Why? Because the cord is bulbous there. And how much? 1 to 2 millimeter at the level of the C67. At the level of the C2, the diameter, posterior epidural space diameter is C5 millimeter. And then at the level of the T23, the, again it becomes compressed. So there, the posterior epidural space diameter is again 3 to 4 millimeter. So now, if the patient is flexing the neck, then the cord will be drawn up. So the upper thoracic epidural space now will be coming in the lower cervical area. So that means flexing the neck, you can increase the posterior epidural space diameter. From 1 to 2 millimeter, you can make it to 3 to 4 millimeter. So at which level cervical epidural is done? It's always at the level of the C71. Wherever is your pathology, your needle entry point will be always through the space between the C71. If for any reason you cannot go for that, the next space will be your C6, C7. If you still cannot go, your third choice is your T1, T2. With the increasing volume, we can go up. But first choice is always C7, T1. So what should you do? Patient should be lying prone with the neck flexed. CM positions on the AP view and you are targeting on the AP view you are targeting the T1 lamina lamina of thoracic one then after you are touching the bone you should walk over the bone up and towards midline till you are coming at the edge of the lamina where you are no longer feeling the bone. Then you should make it a contralateral oblique and then you should be getting the same lamina where you are hitting with the needle as a teardrop. The other side, that means ipsilateral lamina will be broad, with broad square, but the contralateral lamina will be like a teardrop. So then you have to go to the upper margin of the tear drop already you are there and in between the two tear drop which is not visible is your ligamentum shaft. But you have to always remember another very important thing that in cervical and thoracic area sometimes ligamentum fibrum is absent. So you have to imagine that this is the ligamentum fibrum area but even if you are not getting the typical loss of resistance should not be advancing the needle further. It should be once you are at the edge of the tear drop, superior edge of the tear drop, you start a lower and you give a little bit of dye and then you progress further. If you are getting a lower, it's fine, then you give the dye, now the dye will be spreading anterior margin or anterior borders of the tear drops. But if you are not getting a lower, when you see that the needle tip is just crossing that line, anterior border of the tear drops, then you should start giving the dye again to see that whether it is going. So the loss of resistance is not mandatory here. So here what is important is your, whether your dye is spreading along the anterior margin of the tear drops or not. That is the contraband. 
and then you make the CM again in the epithelium and see whether the dye is coming out of the foramen. So when the dye is coming out of the foramen along with the nerve root, that is the contramaterial. That is the most important part. If the dye is limited in the midline, then you might have punctured the dura. Your dye might have gone into the endothelial space. The CSF is not always seen, particularly if a small flap of the dura is obstructing your needle tip, even the aspiration or free flow of CSF might not be there. So we have to understood by the dye. If you are still having confusion, give little more dye and see whether the dye is coming out of the foramen. If the dye is coming out of the foramen and the neural nerve root is visualized, that is confirmatory. So the epidural dye spread character is it will be heterogeneous and it should be coming out of the foramen. Till you are seeing dye is in the midline, give more dye. And if you are still not sure, then you can abandon the procedure but never give the drug. So two things are very dangerous, intravascular and interthecal. Interthecal, you might be landing up with the total spinal anesthesia. And intravascular means again, particular steroid can be very dangerous. So here, non-particular steroid is preferred, but still the particular steroid can be given. But non-particular steroid is preferred because it is a dangerous area as the brain is very close and with cervical epidural, the reports are there with particular steroid with a stroke and death with cervical epidural. This is more common with the transforaminal. That's why transforaminal cervical epidural is nowadays abundant, but still it can happen with the interlaminal epidural as well because epidural space is very highly vascular. So epidural steroid injection is one of the most dangerous procedure in all the areas, all the areas. Fascia joint, medial branch, these all are not that serious procedure because you are away, you are not entering into the spinal canal. Here you are entering into the spinal canal and lots of vasculature is there. That is the reason why if you are talking about the fascia joint which is more invasive, which is having the more number of complications, the anywhere the fascia joint is comparatively safer than the epidurals. So again complications can be short term and long term. Short term means intravascular and the intrathecal split and long term means your or delayed complication, not long term the immediate complication and delayed complications. Delayed complications are related with the hematoma. It can compress the cord hematoma. So the patient should be warned what through the post procedure advice. Patient should be warned that if you are having any um, uh, the symptoms like uh, the muscle weakness, any numbness, difficulty in walking, disturbed gait, immediately report hospital or if the patient is having convulsions, if the patient is having the difficulty in visions, so all those things should be immediately reported. These are late complications and uh, though it's there, but it must be nicely explained to the patient. Okay. So all the points are important.